Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the second to last lecture for the first semester. And today we're going to talk about DNA structure and replication. This is continuing on in our molecular genetics unit. So let's go ahead and get started. First, we're going to take a look at the history of how DNA was discovered. And we really start off with Frederick Griffith. He did experiments concerning the transformations of S and R strains of a bacterium. The S and R stand for smooth and rough. And what he found out was that um, the smooth ones were the ones that killed the mice and the rough ones did not. This is the first evidence of some genetic factor that is transferable because he did the heat killed uh, S cells and so on and so, so forth. Oswald Avery followed up proving that DNA was the agent of transfer in the bacterial transformation. Um, so he was able to take Griffith's experiments and kind of isolate down the factors that were actually taking place here, causing those little mice to die because the R strain picked up the DNA from the S strain. In the 20s, Edwin Shargaff, a um, handsome guy there on the left, decided that he was going to start analyzing um, the different components. By this point, they had discovered the different components of DNA. They didn't actually know um, that DNA was necessarily the factor of life, but he saw that they were always in certain ratios, in that adenine and thymine always existed in ratios that were close to each other, and cytosine and guanine were the, in ratios to each other as well. Now, each one was isolated initially from where it was discovered, and guanine was the first because it was discovered in bat guano, and I believe cytosine was the last. But he found that, you know, A's goes with T's and C's goes with G's, and remember that for later. Along came Rosalind Franklin in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and she worked in England on a large organic molecules, and she used a new technique at the time called X-ray crystallography. Basically what they did was they fired X-rays at big molecules, and the X-rays would bounce off in different um, diffractive patterns, and you could use those diffractive patterns to identify what the straight shape of the actual molecule was. And so um, she broke the ground on the structure of DNA. Her findings were this image right here. This is the classic DNA image. And this showed that DNA is a long, thin molecule with a uniform diameter because it's not wobbling all over the place. And that also that it's helical. Well, down the, down the hallway were um, Watson and Crick. And James Watson was one of the youngest PhDs ever awarded, and uh, Francis Crick was his partner. Watson's an American, Crick was British. And um, they worked with Franklin and her partner, Maurice Wilkins, um, a little bit and they took a look at Franklin's x-ray diffraction photo and they went, oh my gosh, it's not just a helix, it's a double helix. And because of Shargaff's rule, they were able to pair up the bases, the adenine to thymine and the cytosine to the guanine, and they held them together by hydrogen bonding. And they were the first one to create the real accurate model of DNA, and this was in the early 50s. Um, and they figured out that base pair sequences differ from species to species. And in 1953, they received the Nobel Prize and shared it with Franklin's partner, Maurice Wilkins. Franklin didn't get left out. She left herself out. She decided that she was going to take her ball and go home. She declined to share in the prize, and she left the field of study altogether. She kind of stomped off in a huff. So DNA is now known to match the Watson and Crick model of the double helix. So if you remember back to organic macromolecules, this is our nucleotide, uh, our basic nucleotide. Its DNA is composed of four types of nucleotides, which contain a five carbon sugar. In this case, DNA is deoxyribose, a phosphate group, and one of four nitrogenous bases, and the bases are the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. The nitrogenous bases in DNA are, are those four, 
and adenine bonds with thymine and cytosine bonds with guanine according to Chargaff's rule. And you'll notice that one, uh, the two that bond together, one has a double ring on the nitrogenous base and one has a single ring and they join together. Those are actually called purines and pyrimidines, but you don't need to know that. Okay, so that's the basics of DNA. And now we're going to talk about how it actually multiplies itself, how it makes copies. And that process is called DNA replication. This occurs, if you remember back to your mitosis notes, this occurs during the S phase, the synthesis phase, prior to cell division. So this is happening during the middle part of interphase. Just remember that replication and duplication kind of mean the same thing. So first you start off with two strands of DNA that have to unwind to expose these bases. Then the unattached bases produced in the nucleus will come into the exposed fragments and pair with the exposed bases. This results in DNA molecules that have one old strand and one new strand. So this is called semi-conservative replication. The unwinding process requires many different types of enzymes. Primase is one enzyme that helps the process get started. DNA polymerase assembles the nucleotides into new strands. Polymerase also proofreads the finished strands and fixes any mismatches with using the help of other enzymes. Okay, so with that in mind and with Chargaff's rule in mind, I want you to take a chance and practice with this. So we're taking a look at the original SAN, T-T-A-C-G-G-T-C-A-C-C-A. -C -G -G -C -C Okay, and so your job is to put down the complementary strand. In other words, what bonds with the T, what bonds with the next T, what bonds with the A, and so on. So pause the lecture and go ahead and try that out for you. Good. Okay, DNA technology is another big aspect in the news. It's all over the news. And so it's one of the, I, this is a very, very, very short uh, overview of DNA technology kind of as it stands or as it stood. So one of the main things that we do with DNA technology is genetic engineering. This means that we're transferring a gene segment, a segment, which is a segment of DNA from one organism to another. We use that in farming, we use that in making, uh, in pharmaceuticals, we make drugs using bacteria that are genetically modified. Um, we use bacteria to produce things like insulin for diabetics because we used to have to get it out of horses. Uh, it's a lot of time consuming and costly process, but the bacteria can just turn into little factories and they produce the insulin for us. Uh, we create genetic resistant plants um, for things like pesticide resistance or herbicide resistance and so on and so forth. Recombinant DNA is DNA made from the DNA of two different organisms. And so we cut the strands and put them together and we make recombinant DNA. Sounds a lot like the plot of Spider-Man, but it actually does occur. When we join DNA from two organisms, it's actually called splicing, and we use specific enzymes in order to do that. Sometimes we also use gene cloning. Um, this is making identical copies of DNA. Usually what we do is we make tons and tons and tons of copies, and why do we do that? It's so we can actually detect what the strands say. Um, we use this most often with um, DNA uh, polymerase using that enzyme. And what we do is we use this in what's called RFLP, restriction fragment length polymorphisms, because those are the things we look at when we do a DNA um, identification for things like a paternity suit or things like identifying a murderer uh, or a rapist and things like that. So we use this process, this gene cloning in the lab in order to make enough copies so that we can measure it and so we can get an accurate view of what their DNA actually says because we have to have a certain amount to be able to detect it. And so with the gene cloning, we can use these RFLPs, these polymorphisms, because everybody's got different amounts of copies of almost junk DNA 
um, we can use that to determine things like inheritance and we can determine things like guilt in major crimes. So it's quite important in uh, things like um, forensics labs and things like that. One of the other things we do are create transgenic organisms, and I kind of mentioned this a second ago, but these are organisms carrying a gene for a particular trait that was transferred from an organ, another organism. And these, we can have transgenic bacteria, we can have transgenic plants, we can have transgenic animals. In fact, we do. If you go to your local Walmart, go to the um, fish section and go take a look at the aquarium fish. There's a couple of ones called... Um, they're a type of zebra danio, and they glow in the dark. They're called glowfish. And the reason they glow in the dark, they were started out as an experiment to see if we could create this transgenic organism um, for uses down the road. But they actually contain jellyfish genes that make them glow fluorescent colors. And so now they've become part of the pet industry. So those are transgenic organisms you can see in your daily life. Gene therapy is another type of genetic technology that we're starting to use. Um, the first trials of gene therapy haven't gone super well, but more and more trials are going on now, and they're going a lot better because we've learned from the mistakes. But what we do is we use viruses basically as injectors, and we put the normal gene in the virus and then give it to the person, and that virus will then insert the proper gene into your cells to help fix you. Um, so basically they're like little tiny microscopic pills. Um, and these are used to correct genetic disorders. The one that's primarily been focused on right now um, has been on cystic fibrosis, but they're starting to branch out into other areas to use this gene technology, this gene therapy, in order to help alleviate certain things. Um, and some of the trials are going well, some of the trials are going not so well, but we're learning uh, as we go. Finally, and I talked about it with gene cloning, but DNA fingerprinting is another part of it. This can be used to solve crimes or determine the identif identity of biological parents. The DNA fragments are cloned and then they are analyzed, and each individual, except for identical twins, has unique DNA patterns. So if you take a look at Mary and the two possible fa fathers, Bob and Larry, and you take a look at the child, you see where it matches up, and you can see here that Larry is the father of the child, because it's a combination of Mary and Larry for the child. Okie dokie. Um, that was really brief overview of DNA structure, replication, and technology. We're going to go into protein translation and transcription next time, but um, that will round out the entire semesters. So this is important stuff, so make sure that you're reviewing it as you go because the semester exam's coming up pretty soon. Have a fantastic day!